Hi, this is Dr. Andrew Chrysler teaching electromagnetics. In this video, I'm going to give a quick overview of Amperian contours and their relationship to Gaussian surfaces. So previously, during electrostatics, we used Gaussian surfaces. Gaussian surfaces, we said, had an inside and an outside. It was a closed surface, and it contained the source of a field. If the field is E, the electric field, then E dot N is constant. So there's a constant electric field. Uh, at all points on that Gaussian surface. And so we use that to solve for the quantity of the source, and the source is Q, or charges, which created that field E, which was constant everywhere, normal to that Gaussian surface. Only symmetric sources of Q, those charges, could fulfill that constant E dot normal requirement. And so that really only worked for a lot of very simple cases. Infinite planes, infinite lines, maybe some spheres, concentric spheres, etc. So limited use cases, but convenient mathematically. Likewise, the Amperian path and the uh, Gauss's law for magnetism can be applied uh, in magnetostatics. Now for the Amperian path, this is a closed loop path. So instead of a closed volume, it's a closed loop. The source of a field passes through that closed loop. So for magnetostatics, if the field is H, then H is constant everywhere on the loop, and the source of that field H is a current I, which is at some constant current, since we're in magnetostatics. So the applications for this would be to solve for the quantity of that the source of the field H, so solve for the quantity of the current, constant current I, which creates that field H. Now, only symmetric sources of the current can fulfill that constant H requirement, for, and that really only works for simple selected paths. So again, this is going to be uh, somewhat limited in use, but convenient mathematically. Now, let's contrast this to the Biot-Savart law, which can generate complex, potentially unsolvable integrals. The Biot-Savart law can create a solution for any current distribution, asymmetric or not, but it has very complex integrals. However, Ampere's law it could reduce that path integral basically down to algebra. It makes things a lot easier. It offers students a window into the past on how people used to solve these complex electromagnetics problems. It also is going to force you to think a little bit about what the relationship between fields and the sources might be, because you have to do a little bit of predicting what the field is going to look like based on the source. So in the general case of an Amperian uh, path, we're going to have this integral where we have the source current I on the left hand side, and then this path integral with the field H on the right hand side. And we're taking the field H and we're dotting it with some DL as we go around some closed loop path. Now, if we're going to do that integral, we can see that it could end up being sort of complicated, right? If you had a differential path length like this, you could end up with at least three different integrals that you have to do in cylindrical coordinates, for example. Now, what if you're able to be very clever and realize, hmm, perhaps some of these are actually equal to zero? So what if you're able to look at the source on the left-hand side and realize something about the field on the right hand side and realize, ah yes, these ones are actually zero. Then you would be able to reduce that path integral down into just this one E component. Now this could be done for some uh, other cases, but it really only works for these very simple symmetric cases. And, and there's only a few of them. So these are the main symmetry cases where we're able to be very clever about taking this H dot DL integral. So in this case, for infinite currents, H dot DL would reduce down to just that phi component. And this is the place where your intuition would get to shine, right? You could predict or realize that if the current is traveling upwards and you use that right hand rule, you could predict that the field H is only going to be in that uh, phi direction. Okay, so this is a symmetrical case and you can smartly realize that that R and Z components are gonna go away. Now, likewise, these two other cases, the toroid or solenoid case and the infinite sheet case also have some uh, special intuition which you can do to realize that the field component is only going to contain uh, one of those field components and you can reduce that path integral down to algebra. So this forces you to use your intuition between the field H and the 
um, the current I. Now, can you think of any other symmetric current distributions? Most likely not. There's only a few of them, and those are basically the ones that I showed on this slide. So there's only a few cases of these. Some of them can be made slightly more complex, right? This one, the infinite current, this one can be, you can add as many concentric rings of, of current as you want to it, um, but there's not a lot of other cases for it. Now, one other note that I want to make as part of this overview is how do you know which direction the current is? Well, if you take the path in this direction C, use the right hand rule, that's how you know which direction that positive current is in. And then second, uh, as just a bit of intuition on how to solve these, first, this right hand side, right, you should only need to solve this once. This is going to be the same for each case, right? And this is going to give you the intuition in this case that it's just going to be this uh, HV component, whereas the right hand side, right, you're going to need to solve this integral where you take the current through a surface, you're going to need to solve this multiple times. So for the first case, right, if your first path contains just this one current, right, you'll need to solve this once. Then as you go out a little bit further, so let's say this has another current density, you would need to solve for the current that goes through this path and so on. So you could have an infinite number of symmetric or uh, concentric rings and you would just need to uh, go further and further out as you solve for your field H as a function of radius as you go uh, further out in this. So hope this helps and I'll see you in the next video.